Let's go! Let's go! So this first video, let's just get started right away. What the Tamales. fuck is storyboarding? What is it? And I actually got this question from a good friend of mine, uh, Cassie Levin, who is actually working at DreamWorks Animation uh, on the Bad Guys feature that has been announced a while back. So Cassie, thank you so much for this question. Before I even started this, this channel, I asked people on my Instagram page uh, what kind of things they would want to see from me in this channel. I'm basically going to use those suggestions as the as the meat of this course because I'm trying to make this course for you guys to serve two purposes. One, to watch in order and it's going to be in little chunks to hopefully get you guys to not only watch them in order but to also have you guys come back to those specific videos in case you missed a, a piece of information or if you just want to really deep dive more into that specific subject. So this is what this channel is all about. It's about you guys really being able to digest this information into chunks because to tell you the truth, it's it's a lot to take in. And it was something that I kind of took in all at the same time when I was in school. And I want this first video, which is about storyboarding, what it is, to really be something that isn't so overwhelming and something that can get you guys eager and motivated to start. How does someone begin actually doing the Tamales. thing? How does someone begin actually boarding? How do you go about approaching this thing that is in a way daunting, but at the same time, very exhilarating and, and rewarding in the end. So storyboarding to me, in a nutshell, layman's terms, is where in an animation pipeline or in a live action pipeline, you have the writers writing everything out. They're the ones writing all the crazy action set pieces. They're the ones figuring everything out. They're the ones basically writing the meat and potatoes of what this movie's gonna be or show. And then from there, in animation, that script gets passed along and distributed between multiple storyboard artists and they're the ones that visually translate the script into what the movie is about what the movie is going to be and think of it as like a blueprint for if say an architect is designing a house they they actually got to design the blueprint they got to design what the house is going to look like before even starting to build the house so hopefully that analogy helps because that's seeing it through a very technical perspective and and that's a good way of diving into how to start but i also want to explain what storyboarding is from an emotional standpoint because really storyboarding is a marriage of these two ideas. The functional side of storyboarding, which is basically getting the camera placed in the right positions to tell the story, but also having storyboarding be an emotional experience as well. How do you elicit an emotional response through the shots that you choose? And so if you think about it from a viewer's perspective, you're watching this movie and you're basically, we're basically at the whim of what the director is showing us. The director is choosing their shots intentionally to get us to react a certain way. And that's something that is super important that isn't really talked about as much because you can go into the nitty gritty, all the technical mumbo jumbo of how storyboarding works through different terminology. But really the biggest thing to consider when it comes to boarding is how are your shots and compositions and storytelling skills gonna help get the emotional response from the viewer. Originally, I wanted to kind of just break down how I kind of started storyboarding, but I realized that that itself could be just another video. But in a nutshell, I'll just tell you guys that when I started storyboarding, I was already in my fourth year of college. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I didn't really know how to draw an animated style. I basically had no idea what the heck I was doing. I didn't know shit about how to approach storyboarding. And for me, the way I started was just through my animation pre-production class uh, with Mike Dietz, who God bless him, is one of the best professors I've ever had. And the way I started was pretty much just actually to start boarding and to actually start making a short film. I started pretty much already like here when I really needed to take a class here. I never took a storyboarding class in school. And so this is this was a great way to start this series was really for me to ask, how do you actually start storyboarding? How do you actually go about taking this whole concept of, of storyboarding and, and really finding that first step? in the right direction. From a very practical approach, the first thing I would say to starting, you find a clip from your favorite movie, it could be about one minute or two, and just watch it from start to finish. And really think about why you chose that scene. Why is that scene something that resonates with you? Why is it something that you'd wanna watch over and over again? And really think about the shot selections of the director. Really think about how the director is approaching this scene. You can watch it once through like a viewer and just get a sense of the emotions of it. And then from there, watch it again and really understand why is it you feel the way that you feel. And then from there, and again, I'll discuss this more in the next video, just take that scene and draw each shot of that scene. 
take a piece of paper, take your iPad Pro, whatever you use to draw, and just start drawing. It doesn't matter if you already know what the technical terms are. I would say just start drawing it out, just, just based on, on, on what you just saw. Do that, and then that will get you into the mindset of what a story artist does, because from there, that's really what it is. You're basically doing the same thing that a artist is already doing, where they're, they're coming up with these ideas in these small, rough drawings. And I would say find scenes from movies directed by, you know, the masters, Steven Spielberg, Alfred Hitchcock. Find clips like that that will get you into the mindset of how to approach storyboarding. And again, just a disclaimer, if you guys are thinking, wait, 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 whoa, whoa, this isn't how I would start. Again, that's totally fine. This is a way of starting. This is how I started. This isn't the, the one way of approaching storyboarding, but this is the most practical and, and, and technical way of approaching it. And that's something that I, I really want to emphasize uh, in these videos. I want this to be something that anybody can approach. Basically, what you're doing in this step is, is studying film, and that's, that's called the film study. The next thing you can do is look at professional storyboard artist portfolios. Studying storyboard artist portfolios is the most valuable thing that I got from learning how to be a better storyboard artist. Nothing helps more to get a sense of how to learn than to actually look at what the professionals are doing. That speaks tons and tons of volumes in terms of the kind of work and expectations that need to be met in order to get into the industry. And that's something that I did. And actually something I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a document with uh, a list of portfolios that I look up to and I, I constantly study all the time. I'm gonna create a list and I'm gonna link it down below in the description. And a lot of these people that I've met are friends of mine and also people that I really look up to. And these are server portfolios that you can reference from so that in the future, you can actually start making your own portfolio and base it off of that. And that's how I based off my portfolio. What are you going to bring to the table when it comes time for you to storyboard something? And that's something that you learn from by looking at their work. Woo, I'm getting excited. And also too, Instagram is chock full of information and chock full of amazing, amazing knowledge and resources from some of the best artists in the industry. The next thing would be to actually look at storyboard comparison videos. And for example, Nickelodeon Animation is a big proponent of this. They post a lot of their storyboard comparison to Final Animation videos uh, from the new Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And those animatics are super, super valuable in really showing you how a storyboard actually looks in motion in comparison to what the final animation is. I'm gonna put these uh, videos that I've seen that I look up to that I save on my Instagram and YouTube in the description below for you guys to check out. Hey guys, so for the second part of this video, I wanna give a quick recap on what I talked about before, as well as giving you guys a Storyboard 101 course, which you know is basically a lecture, but at the same time, a quick demo to get you guys started on this whole storyboarding journey. So recap on how to begin. One, look at film as a viewer, then as a filmmaker. Two, look at professional storyboard artist portfolios. And three, look at storyboards in context to the final animation. Doing this, you see the end result before you begin. Knowing your destination will help you on how to start learning. You start to understand the bigger picture. And again, just to emphasize on these three points, seeing the film as a viewer makes you see the bigger picture and it makes you understand how the director is helping you guide your emotions through the story with intention and purpose. And with looking at storyboard artist portfolios, you're seeing the end result before you begin. And that helps you gain a clearer path on how to begin. And that is super important. Because otherwise, if you start off on your path not knowing where you're going to end up, that's going to give you more time to struggle, more time to be frustrated over, you know, what it is you need to do to get better. So knowing the end result will help you in the long run with getting better results and getting better a lot faster. And then again, looking at storyboards in context to the final animation, this is super critical too, because you're seeing how important storyboards are, especially in TV animation, where the blueprint has to be almost set in stone uh, for the animation studio overseas to animate the storyboards and make the animation as good as it can be. And so that's a really important thing, because if you understand proper posing, composition, and all the other fundamentals I'm gonna talk about, it's gonna make your storyboarding and your skills a lot better in the long run. So now let's get started. Let's start off with Storyboarding 101, the good stuff. A key term that is gonna be thrown out a lot and is really important because the entire foundation of effective storytelling revolves around a solid understanding of composition. This term gets thrown out a lot, but I just want you guys to know that basically what it is to me is how the elements such as the characters and environment in film are arranged on screen and in the camera frame to tell a story. 
this is what I think. I go, of course, it's totally subjective. You guys can come up with whatever definitions you want for composition, but basically composition is the foundation of good storytelling, no matter what, whether it's storyboarding, character design, uh, visual development, uh, narrative illustration, fine art, whatever. Composition is important because it helps to visually get a sense of what is going on through, su through the subtext, uh, as well as the emotions of the certain scene or story that the artwork's trying to tell. And this is super important. So I'm gonna throw out composition a lot just so you guys know what it is on a technical level, as well as an emotional level. So we are storytellers and the tools that we acquire and learn over time will make us better storytellers. Of course, good storytelling is subjective, but it is also important to utilize guides and principles to make your filmmaking and storytelling evoke the intended response from the viewer. This is what I think and whatever you want to define it as is totally fine. But really, again, with the whole subjectivity thing, you know, certain filmmakers can have a better grasp of telling stories than others. But at the end of the day, you have to understand the fundamentals and the tools that it will take to make you a much better storyteller and to understand the craftsmanship that goes behind telling good stories. You can't just go out and just, you know, tell a story. Maybe you could, but to tell a better story, to, to, to really craft a story, you know, in a way that makes people feel intended emotions, like I said here, that's going to make your storytelling a lot better and a lot more impactful in the end. So again, some people might have the talent and a knack for just telling good stories, but at the end of the day, you need to know these fundamentals in order to be able to be more consistent with your storytelling and have a more innovative and practical approach to telling good stories and hopefully in the long run, teaching this to other people. So a quick breakdown of what I'm gonna talk about. So talk about basic camera terms, rule of thirds as I call it, but rule of thirds, the 180 degree rule slash screen direction, size variations, jump cuts, varying shapes, negative space, and, and a quick note on lighting. So let's start with different you know, types of, of camera shots. So we have the master shot slash establishing shot. The function to establish the scene and set up the geography of the character within the environment. But the purpose, which is a more subjective take on, on this, is to show the scale of an environment to evoke a sense of feeling small or isolated to set up an epic battle or showdown or to represent freedom breathing. So I separate out these definitions by function and purpose because function is more of the technical definition of, of what I think, you know, this shot, uh, you know, works as. But then the purpose is more of how can the filmmaker utilize this this type of camera move or angle to evoke a certain response from the eyes, not just to say, okay, we need an established shot just because we need to get that coverage. You also want to think in terms of how your shots are going to evoke a certain emotion because again, storytelling. And, and especially filmmaking is a very emotional endeavor and you want the audience to, to, to empathize and to connect with this story. You don't want them taken out. All right, let me go back. Here's use an example of a master shot where you have the environment. I put a foreground element here just to add a sense of depth. And that's something I forgot to add is that, is that this type of shot can evoke a sense of depth, which is super, super important. A medium shot, the function to emphasize more of the characters acting while still providing a wide view of their surroundings. The purpose, to show a sense of depth if, the cam if, the, if a character is close to camera, to get a peek into the mindset of the character, have a more intimate view of characters interacting, showing their emotions. So in this example here, excuse me, the camera is a lot closer on the character, so you get a much better sense of their acting and, and, and their mindset. But at the same time, the camera is still wide enough to get a sense of the environment. So that way, uh, you're not just so you're not omitting any important information. For example, in the story here, this knight is traveling through you know this forest, but is encountering this mysterious threat in the background. And that's something that's super important too: is that the medium shot can omit only the irrelevant information. So if this were to be a master shot, it would be an irrelevant choice because you're capturing all this other information that just doesn't make sense where as with the medium shot the information is more here that way uh, the audience can immediately read what the situation is in this in this scene close-up shot function to give viewer a clearer look at the acting and features of a character to see their reactions to the events around them purpose to humanize a character to step into their world soul slash soul to evoke claustrophobia, give the character a feeling of empowerment or a feeling of intimacy bond. So here, of course, you have this, you know, African-American man being arrested by cops and all this stuff is irrelevant. You know that he's being surrounded by this awful situation where he's being subjected to this injustice, 
but the main focus here is is you know his face because you want to humanize this character and understand that he is being wrongly uh you know uh, wrongly accused of a certain thing that he didn't do and so having this close-up helps to kind of give us a sense into his soul and and really he, empathize and humanize with with this character and, the, and close-ups can also be something that beginner artists could exploit and that's just the you know my, my take is that uh, when I was starting off storyboarding, I would utilize a lot of close-ups just because I wasn't able to technically draw out these, you know, these, you know, uh, environments and, and it was just hard for me to really, you know, hone in on that craft of being able to establish the environment and that was something that I needed to learn. And so close-ups are pretty much the thing that you could use towards the very end where once you've established the environment, once you've gotten a sense of where the character is in, then you can utilize close-ups to really hammer home, you know, your emotional beats. And then you have, lastly, an extreme close-up. So the function to give the closest feeling of being on screen with the character or subject. There is also the POV shot. So again, you know, with an extreme close-up, it could be, you know, a really detailed close-up of a certain object or character. We also have the POV shot where and this is what I'm talking about next, where you emphasize solely on an important detail that is important with the narrative or drama of the story you're telling. So the purpose of it is to set up an impending danger to elevate the significance of a character or object, to show the intensity of a scene through the eyes of the character, give an unconventional view to everyday things around us. So in this shot here, you can see that this, you know, this woman has endured some kind of trauma because as you can see there's blood trickling from her face and again we can have a close-up of her face but in the end the one thing I want to focus on is her her lo the lower part of her face emphasizing and representing visually this trauma that she's just endured and that can be very powerful is having these extreme close-ups to help emphasize certain points that you wouldn't really see naturally in the real world and this is stuff that again these are tools that you can use to emphasize dramatic story points and not just have them be checklists off a filmmaker's guide where it's like okay we, we we did all this coverage that's it without ever digging deep into why are you choosing these shots that's the main thing why are you choosing these shots to get the the response that you want you need to have intention and again like i said extreme close-up but again it, this is what we would call an insert shot and the function of it is to give the closest feeling of being on screen with the care oh this is actually what i just repeated but again the same thing applies to here where with an insert shot you're solely focusing on an important detail. So for example, this locket, this has significance because this is almost taking up the entire camera frame. And that's a really important thing to notice too, is especially in certain story moments, you wanna be able to have these shots, make it very clear for the audience and say, hey, this is important, I need you to look at this and remember that later as the story goes on. Now we go on to rule of turds. Very, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna go too much into detail because it's pretty self-explanatory. If you guys want more more information or, or, or more in-depth look into rule of thirds, uh, you know, let me know and then I can make a video about that. But again, rule of thirds is basically how to set up a camera, how to set up your shots in a very dynamic way. So I had this here too because you can use this on occasion. So a lot of times, you know, in, in schools or, you know, in, in fundamental instruction by other professors or filmmakers, they say that you shouldn't frame your character at the very center of the frame and i would say use this on occasion because it's not fair to say don't use this because in a way kubrick stanley kubrick made his whole career off of staging characters in the very center of the frame so use this on occasion and here here's what i wrote down in terms of what it uh, you know a centered composition represents so using a center composition can be good if you want to emphasize symmetry stability balance or a sense of epicness if you're trying to set up a character before an epic battle you can also feel boxed in but for the most part if you're not using this shot for these intended purposes it'll come off flat and boring and you're not gonna you're not giving yourself enough flexibility to experiment with other types of shots so use use it on occasion they'll use it a lot because in the end you're, you're not really providing any variety or any sense of entertainment or drama with these kinds of shots and it'll bore the audience so here's a way to compose. Again, this is a tool. They call it a rule, but in the end, it's, it's a guide for you to help give yourself more flexibility and more options for creating shots. So a way to, so this, is, this would be the way to compose, and this is how I compose shots. And it's cool because this kind of framing allows for more dynamic camera angles 
It feels more natural. It, it can show dramatic conflict with the, between characters and it helps to establish depth and intensity fairly easily. And it helps to establish scale, which is something that I'm going to talk about later on. So here you have this character uh, feeling a sense of, 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 you know, threat from these characters here, these thug looking characters, but it could be vice versa. These characters could be good and this character could be bad. It all depends on how you tell your story. But again, these tools help to, to ensure that you're getting the intended response from the audience. So disclaimer, before you at me, I consider this a tool, not a rule. Just like I said, there are times where your shots can be symmetrical. Stanley Kubrick made a career out of it. Also this, this is a guide to help you have more flexibility with placing character topics. Damn, I got him myself. Nice. Again, here's our drawing of Spider-Man. And to demonstrate, again, you don't have to put your subjects, you know, literally on these, these guides. These are just focal points that help to uh, create a sense of, of variety and create a sense of dynamism. And this is something called the golden ratio, which I'm not really going to talk about. You don't need to know that shit. Uh, but here, you know, again, these are the intersection points, but I have Spider-Man framed here. So it doesn't matter as long as your intended response is to create a sense of depth. And in this case, I feel like I succeeded in that by showing him, you know, in one of the tallest buildings overlooking the city. Shots and context. This goes into more shot progression, which I'll, I'll go into more detail in another video because that itself is another beast uh, to, to handle. So shots and context, context, way to introduce the scene. So now that I mentioned these camera angles in isolation, how would they look like in context with each other? How do you go from a wide shot to a medium shot to a close up? And so here you have the most basic ways of, sh of setting up your scene, because in the end, each scene is, is going to take place in a different location. So you want the audience to get a sense of where, where your environments are at and making sure that it's clear that if a character is going from their house to the park, making it clear that they're doing that and not having any confusions whatsoever. So the basic ways of setting up, setting up your shots, and this will be the demo part, you have you start off with a, a long shot, you're an establishing shot, then cut to a medium shot, then to a close up. Or you can cut from a close to a, you know, you can start at a close up, then go to a long shot and then a medium shot. And you can vary things up, but it all makes sense. It all has to make sense with the story. Introduce a scene with clarity. Again, in order for this to be second nature, understanding these basics is a must. So, you know, if you're you're a first time storyboarder and you're not you haven't really, you know, gotten that many storyboards under your belt, knowing this is super important because the more you do this, the more you're going to get a, a sense of how to establish your shots in more creative ways. And I mean and by that I mean scenes, establishing your scenes in a way that's going to be a lot clearer. So here for the demo, we start off this scene with an establishing shot of this, you know, mysterious cowboy overlooking these rocks in this, you know, desert the stranded desert so then how would i go about you know creating the next shot here so in this case for a medium shot i would actually draw out the cowboy's reaction so here i actually have another monitor where i have reference on like cowboy hats and how to draw cowboys and so I wanted to demonstrate this as a demo because this is how you're going to start storyboarding. This is how you're actually going to begin the whole process of being a an efficient storyteller and being able to craft your shots using these tools. So for example here, a medium shot will help to establish the cowboy's reaction to this, this situation. And I'm loosely referencing the, the establishing shot that I had. So you kind of have them in more of a, I don't even know if Cowboy's dressed like this, but who cares? And it's hot, but I mean, this guy probably adores it. Let me give him a little poncho here, just for funsies. And also too, the way I'm drawing, I'm drawing very loose. Uh, he's are curious about my brush, it's basically this type of shape, you know, an angled chisel brush. Again, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, you don't have to really worry about brushes because in the end, it's a matter of how you actually draw out your lines and, and, and using your, your lines in an economic way. And I can talk about that more in a later video. And so I know I'm gonna talk about lighting in a bit, but here, 
especially in feature animation. Lighting is a good component and a good tool to use to really enhance the drama of things. It helps to really sell the emotion just through lighting, just through tone. And I'm here, I'm just going to lay down a quick tone. And it's a sunny day, so the sky itself will not be too crazy. But something to know about the properties of sky, it's usually darker at the top than at the bottom. So that'll help you get a sense of uh, the type of sky you want to use in your storyboards. It's a little too dark. And then here I might add some clouds just for fun. And I, I'm not worried about the, the detail of this. If it sells the point, it sells the point. That's all I care about. And then I'll just add a quick grid line. But just know that I'm going to lower the opacity on this because one thing to know about grid lines once we start getting into that is that they get really distracting if you have it call attention to itself. If you find a way to imply grid lines kind of like this, the main focus is on the character. The main focus is not on showing how well you know grid lines and stuff like that. That, that doesn't matter. So here we have this shot and then we cut to a medium shot. Perfect. And then now we can cut to a close-up. So here we get a better sense of where this character is at. And maybe here he's holding something. Maybe he's holding a, a trinket from a, let's see. Maybe it's a, a doll. Maybe it's something that was from like a, a child that he raised or, or something like that. Again, how you compose your shots will help you really enhance your storytelling abilities because that's what it's all about, is how can you have your, your shot choices help to influence the response from the audience. Because that's, that's why I wanted to pursue storyboarding. This is why I wanted to learn this shit was because of how well movies can really speak to you and, and give you that sense of, of catharsis and power just through through shots alone and so here we go like here I'm not getting it perfect the first time I'm adjusting camera angles uh, who knows maybe I might shrink a little bit more let me just you know what that way I don't have tangents and a quick note about tangents you don't want this shit you don't want you don't want this stuff competing with lines because in the end it's just super distracting people know that's that stuff and that's why it's important to really hone in on your skill set because otherwise people notice that and, and the last thing you want is for your audience to be thrown out of the story and so here and maybe just to enhance the storytelling maybe he's holstering a gun and I don't know how guns are drawn but in the end you know it doesn't matter because you're establishing this as a cowboy Again, not the best drawing in the world, but it'll do. And sometimes, even just, again, for TV animation specifically, you don't need to have all this crazy lighting and stuff, but for personal storyboarding, it's good to know that. So here you go. To emphasize, too, tone helps to emphasize as well. So if the main emphasis is on this specific, you know, makeshift doll, you can make that an important element by adding tone to it. And this is going to be super helpful because in the end, you want people to read this instantly. You don't want people to, to have a delayed reaction to what it is that you're showing them. So that's important. Cool. And that's it. So we have this shot, master shot, medium shot, then a close-up. But what if, say, or we just take this same drawing. We have a, You can start out with a close-up, right? show the emotional anchor of you know the narrative which is that doll and then you can cut to a medium shot which is this and by the way you like i'm definitely going to talk more about layer comps and how to do that with photoshop and everything but i just want to demonstrate how i storyboard quickly and effectively so we have here close up medium shot then let me just take that white shot 
Cool, let's see. Okay. White shot. Cool. So you can start off here with the medium shot or the close up and you're like, wait, okay, wait, what's going on? And then cut to here and then you're like, oh, okay, this cowboy, you know, means business. Maybe something happened to the person who was the recipient of, of this doll. And then you cut to a wide shot to show the stakes that are about to be to be made with with this story. The cowboy is about to encounter whatever is going on in this strange strange rock rock formation in the desert. Now let's talk about 180 degree tool. Do not cross the line. 180 degree rule or tool guide helps orient the viewer and keeps the screen direction of characters consistent. Screen direction is the direction of a character is the direction of a character is facing relative to the camera. It is dependent, I spelled dependent wrong, damn it, that's why I'm in art, on the 180 degree guide. So here we have this character, you know, this is basically like a Zelda ripoff where visiting a shrine in, in this mysterious cave. As you can see, if you put them in this isometric uh, uh, frame, you can see that the camera moves happen or the camera angles happen in this one guide so it, just imagine you know like a full 360 circle but it is cut in the middle and you can only film around this this line this is called the stage line or the line it's important because it helps to maintain the geography or in other words the the environment in relationship to the character and it makes it clear where we're at and in, it is a general rule of thumb not to film here unless you have completely established the environment around this scene. So for example, if you have a shot here, keep in mind that in the next shot, you want them to look in the same way, but in this case, they're not. So the camera flips the other way and now all of a sudden the, the girl is in the same position as the shrine and now she's looking completely the other way. So you're kind of confused as to where we are in the environment and, and getting a sense of how the scene is going to progress and this is super distracting you do not want that so a quick note on lighting lighting is used more in feature animation because of what they're creating is art while tv animation produces content at a much faster pace lighting is a great tool to use to emphasize key storyboard key story points or, or moods so here you know is the drawing without lighting and then here it is with lighting and feature animation uses this a lot because of course they have more time and you can use this in TV animation too, but use it sparingly. So here, for example, I these two things uh, represent my fingers. So again, to emphasize more on the 180 degree rule, a good way to know that you're you're within the line is that if your both of your characters are still in the same positions in the next shot. So for example, here you have this detective still here, but it's more from his perspective. So this is a really quick and easy way of understanding you know, screen screen direction uh, in relation to setting up your shots. So a big question is, what if another person enters the scene? What happens to that line? A lot of times in a scene, characters enter a scene, making it necessary for a director to adapt and introduce the new character without throwing off the geography of the scene. So here you have, again, similar example with, similar setup with the previous example where you have two characters on the line but what happens if another person enters? So in context, you have these two characters turn, and then here now you're introduced to the third character. So it turns out this line can get shifted or added to, so the original line becomes this line. So once you have these characters look in a certain direction, this eye line can act as another, you know, a surrogate stage line. So now here, you cut to this, and then you can cut to this. So before we couldn't do that because the line is listed here because the characters were looking at each other, but now that they're looking this way, we are allowed to put the camera behind these characters and get a sense of the third character to help orient ourselves a lot better. The eye line of the characters can, can be used to establish a new line. A character looking in the new direction motivates the new camera angle as well as keeping the screen direction and geography of the scene consistent. But also too, again, th these are tools, you can also have just the character's position in the middle create that stage line even if the eye lines are, are you know don't really match the stage line so here you can just put the camera directly behind or in between these two characters to get this kind of shot but you, you use it sparingly because again like it, it technically does break the 180 degree rule but also too if you want to get the story point across this is a great way to do it 
Uh, jump cuts. These are no bueno. Jump cuts should be avoided at all costs. They make the characters look like they're jumping in the frame. It could also be mistaken for a camera move. Doesn't provide much clarity in your info or sense of intention from the director or filmmaker, which would be you. So it's basically this. This could look like a camera move, but it's not. And I call that gross. Jump cuts can distract the audience, but if you want to be intentional, use it during a part of the story that makes sense, like when a character is disoriented or confused. This goes into the topic of shot progression, which I will discuss later. But this is, a, but this is an important topic to discuss in the beginning phases, so one way to avoid this is, and again, before I do that, this is super important because it's distracting the viewer and you're not really giving yourself much options to create dynamic shots. One way to do this is to vary your shapes and size differences. Varying your shapes through size difference means that you can arrange characters in relation to the camera and themselves to visually establish who they are in the story. Having a character closer to the frame can make them look or feel stronger. A character farther away from the camera can look or feel powerless. So for example, you have these two characters framed. You get a sense of who's the alpha, who's, you know, who's not. And then here, if you split them up just into basic shapes, because that's really what it is. If you squint, which I'll show later, if you squint, you're, you're just getting these basic shapes. So not only are these two character shapes, but even the space around them is a shape. And that's, this is called negative space. And this is super important too. Because again, when you go to the next shot, you do the same thing. The negative space is very different than this. And so you see the difference. And I want to point this out because not only does this shot provide size difference between characters, but it's through this... Through this, through the relationship between where this character is and where this character is in relationship to the camera. So three things this does: it makes the composition more dynamic, creates variety in your shapes, establishes the power dynamic between the characters. And again, this is an example of how you would see it if you squinted. You get a sense of where these characters are at. Bearing your shapes through size difference means that you can arrange characters in relation to the camera and themselves to visually establish who they are in the story. Having a character closer to the frame can make them look or feel stronger. A character farther away can look or feel powerless, just like I explained before. So, of course, you know that this guy would be the alpha because he, although he's smaller in frame, he's a lot higher. And again, too, this guy's the powerless one and the one that looks weak because you have these two characters not even fitting the frame, showing their status, and then this poor guy uh, being in the middle of it and being very small. So again, just to wrap this all up, this is just the beginning. Becoming good at something comes from doing. So the more reps you can put in, the more you will see results. Again, this is just like an exercise. Doing these things multiple times. These are like figurative reps to help you get stronger. You will see results, so just do it. Again, thank you guys so much for listening. I hope this was helpful, and I hope that you guys can really get a better sense of how to begin and feel motivated to start. Thank you guys so much, and I'll see you guys in the next video. So please like, comment, and subscribe to my content, and you know, you'll keep getting this good stuff, all right? Take care.